What can be said about the GameCube that hasn't been said a million times already? Well, turns out it's a fair amount, actually. Today, we've put together over 20 minutes of interesting and lesser-known facts about GameCube games just for your enjoyment, covering titles like Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, Tales of Symphonia, Resident Evil's stellar remake, and Resident Evil 4, Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, The Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess, Mario Sunshine, and more. Yes, in celebration of our final release of Digino Gaming Extra, we thought we'd bust a huge load all in one go and give you guys a nice juicy double length release. Not only that, but with Greg and I having helmed the series for all of these years, we thought we'd both take on the narration together. And with all that considered, let's start our fact bonanza with the Pokemon series. The GameCube had a few Pokemon games during its run, with two of the titles being full-blown single-player RPGs. These games had a slightly more dark approach to the usual cutesy style of the series that came before, with the game having a protagonist with a darker outfit and a more adult-oriented region, the Ore region, an urban, dry world inhabited by older people, and was actually inspired by the dry deserts of Phoenix, Arizona. In the second Pokemon RPG on the system, XD Gale of Darkness, a number of references can be found not just to the Pokemon anime, but other anime as well. Once the player reaches Mount Battle Zone 35, a player they can face has a team consisting of a Cacnea and a Chimeco. This trainer states, I've heard someone has the same team combination as me. Do you know him or her? This is a reference to the Pokemon anime, where James of Team Rocket carried a Cacnea and Chimeco during the Advanced Generation series, which was airing during Gale of Darkness's development. This isn't the game's only reference, though. The title's Mecha Groudon vaguely spoofs robots from Mecha anime, but there's a few instances of more precise parody. When the Mecha Groudon launches from underground, it comes up through a large fountain. This is referencing how the Marzinger Z launches in the 1972 anime of the same name, where the giant mech emerges from a fountain. Another Nintendo RPG series we want to mention is Paper Mario. It's pretty much agreed that one of the best entries in the series, if not the best, was on the GameCube with The Thousand Year Door. And as you might expect, a big RPG like this has tons of references. After the game's seventh chapter, Bowser and Kami will go to Poshley Heights looking for a crystal star, where at some point, Pennington will appear. Pennington will accuse the pair of being common thieves, to which Bowser responds, What are you implying? I'm no little thief, I'm... And then the player has to select either I'm a remorseless king of evil, I'm the shadow thief, or I'm Cooper Coot. This second option, Shadow Thief, is a sly nod to another quality Mario RPG, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. In Superstar Saga, a character named Popple teams up with an amnesia-brained Bowser. Popple is a generic small-time thief with delusions of grandeur, and one of the nicknames he gives himself is The Shadow Thief. Let's keep this RPG train going with another beloved Cube title. The Tales franchise didn't really hit it big in the West until it came to the GameCube with Tales of Symphonia. Published by Namco, creators of many other popular series, the game has a small easter egg which makes reference to another underappreciated series in their library, but it was fairly well hidden. There are a number of hidden costumes for the characters of the game, but one costume for Prasia Combatir can only be unlocked by putting her in the lead of the party and going to Lezarino Company in Altamira, then entering the president's office, unlocking her the title of Dream Traveler and an outfit reminiscent of Klonoa. Whilst wearing this costume, she'll make a habit of delivering Klonoa's signature catchphrase, <laughs> though not with quite the same enthusiasm as the rabbit or uh, dog or cat thing that Klonoa is. Prasia's woohoo is delivered in a completely deadpan manner during optional skits and scenes where she wears the outfit. She talks normally whilst in battle, and these lines are not voiced by her voice actor in the English version of the game. However, if the player imports the title they earn to a new game, Prasia will occasionally say woohoo as an end of battle phrase, but only up until a certain plot event. One of the most graphically impressive games on the GameCube was easily the remake of Resident Evil. The attention to detail in this complete recreation of the original survival horror is phenomenal, not just in how it plays, but the extra flavor the developers injected into the experience. Some of these extra details might have eluded many players, however, such as with the tombstones found in the cemetery behind the Spencer Mansion. 
Each grave is marked with Greek text, which mean nothing on their own, but when translated from Greek into Latin characters, they will spell out Capcom. Another detail can be found within the game's item box, where players can store items if their inventory is too full. Despite the fact that players can never see inside of it due to the fixed camera angles, the actual item box in the remake isn't empty. It contains boxes labeled Soft Image, which is the name of the 3D modeling software used for the game. But by adding all these fine details to the remake, which would never have been visible in the original, the language barrier of the developers would also be on show. Text was added to the various items that could be examined from the player's inventory, and with this additional small print, there were more chances for errors to be made. Upon inspecting the ink ribbons used for saving, they'll show ink ribbon for typewriter, royal type, with the word royal mistakenly including the letter I in the middle of it. The latest entry of the Resident Evil series at the time of the GameCube's lifespan was Resident Evil 4, a game which changed the way the series would play, but it didn't change the way players could appreciate the various items within it. Some of the game's weapons have a number of references hidden within them, such as the description of the broken butterfly, which reads, This will make anyone's day. This line, as well as the fact that this weapon is a magnum, is a direct reference to the classic Dirty Harry quote, Go ahead, make my day from the 1983 film Sudden Impact. Another homage to the world of cinema comes up with the minigun that the Gatling Man carries, being based on the M134 from the Arnold Schwarzenegger blockbuster Terminator 2 Judgment Day, as well as the 1987 action romp Predator. But it isn't just cinema getting nods, as might be rather obvious with the Killer 7 Magnum, named after the Capcom game of the same name, which would release later the same year as Resident Evil 4, also produced by Shinji Mikami. The design of this gun, however, is inspired by cinema as well, being based on the AMT Hardballer from 1984's The Terminator. Moving from scary to just a bit weird, Odama is a bizarre GameCube exclusive that somehow managed to blend pinball and warfare with a feudal Japan aesthetic. This was one of the last games published for the Cube by Nintendo and was designed by Seaman creator Yutaka Saito. But today's trivia is more interesting than the game's origins. If the player manages to reach the game's 11th stage, Karasuma Keep, it's possible to discover a hidden bonus level by blasting open the Keep's main gate. This bonus level is a small piece of modern day Kyoto, complete with trains, cars, 21st century citizens, and even Nintendo's own headquarters. And since we're talking about obscure games, the main antagonists of Custom Robo, the Z Syndicate, are certainly shrouded in mystery. For the duration of the game, many characters will try and guess what the Z in their name stands for. While the true meaning is never revealed, there is some interesting trivia surrounding what it could mean. During the A New Journey section of the game, some of the world's NPCs hanging out in the hub park will try to guess what it could mean, with some characters suggesting that it could possibly stand for Zelda, or maybe even Zebes. Zelda is of course a reference to the Legend of Zelda series, while Zebes is a nod to the planet Zebes, the home planet of Samus Aran in the Metroid series. And now for something completely different. This wasn't the only third party game to mention the Legend of Zelda, so something not that completely different then, to be fair. In fact, one non-Nintendo game even featured Link. It must have been difficult for Namco to get Nintendo to agree to them putting Link in Soul Calibur 2, but there was a convenient coincidence that made putting Link in the game a little easier. What we're talking about is the fact that the series characters, Nightmare, Yoshimitsu, and Siegfried, were already voiced by Nobuyuki Hiyama, who just so happened to be the voice actor for Link. Link was a big reason that many gamers bought this title on the Cube instead of other platforms, and despite the fact that Link only appeared once in the series, his playstyle would live on. Soul Calibur 3, which only released on the PS2 and in arcades, has the Sword and Shield discipline. This is largely the same moveset, however a few of Link's more iconic moves, including the Spin Attack and Charge, have been removed. Perhaps one of the most contentious releases on the GameCube was The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Its cell shaded graphics may be widely appreciated now, but on reveal, it caused many heads to turn. 
It's respected as one of the best entries in the series by many these days, and its attention to detail is appreciated. One such detail was discovered in 2016 when an American live streamer known as Fishwaffle64 found that the boss of the Forbidden Woods, Kali Demos, can be defeated in a very unique way. Whilst joking with her audience, a user in her live chat suggested that since Kali Demos is a giant plant monster, perhaps it could be watered using the forest water found at Forest Haven. As it turns out, pouring the water onto the monster's exposed flower head will actually defeat the boss quite easily. While this was performed in the HD Wii U version of the game on stream, the folks over at Nintendo Life tested and confirmed that this secret technique can also be performed in the original GameCube release as well. What makes this secret rather interesting is that the forest water will expire after it's been bottled for 30 minutes, which means players would have to collect the water, enter the dungeon, get to the boss, and drop the water within a 30 minute time span, which could be troublesome. That said, it is possible to leave the dungeon after opening the boss room up, collect the water, and then return to the boss. But this is far from Wind Waker's only obscure secret. The game has highly in text scattered throughout the world, and when translated into English, this text usually gives a fairly straightforward word or two about whatever the text is beside. But occasionally, the highly inscribe holds some interesting details that you'd have no way of knowing without translating the text. For example, there's a board at the Windfall Island Cafe, written in Hylian, which is actually a specials board. When translated, it reads, Today's specials, Lon Lon Milk, 150, Deku Nut Cake, 300, Zora Coffee, 150. While Lon Lon Milk and Deku Nuts have appeared in various Zelda games, to this day, no Zelda title has ever featured a drink called Zora Coffee. Another secret can be found at Windfall Island. There's a grave on the island that's regularly danced around by Tot. This grave has Hylian text on it, which can be read as 831894, to become a great artist, revealing that whoever died was 63 years of age and aspired to be a great artist, appropriately similar to Tot, and from one of Nintendo's biggest franchise to one of their biggest rivals of all time. The GameCube saw one character appear on a Nintendo system that until recently seemed like an impossibility. Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 were ported from the Dreamcast to the GameCube after Sega's attempt at a next generation console proved to be too much for the Japanese developer. This didn't mean that the Dreamcast didn't have strong titles of its own, but with Nintendo being a strong leader in the market, Sega saw it fit to release Sonic's latest 3D adventures on their historic rival system. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was first shown on the system at Nintendo's Space World Event 2001, with the game actually hitting the market only a short few months later, December in Japan and early 2002 elsewhere. This port is believed to have had only six months of development, with many of its graphical assets and functions tweaked during this short span of time. The Chow Gardens, for instance, had GBAs in place of the original Dreamcast VMUs for players that wanted to take their Chow on the go. But when the game was first shown off, there was a slight oversight with these GBAs that Sega fixed in time for launch. The GBA in the Chow Gardens was red, but when Nintendo announced the launch colors for the Game Boy Advance, red wouldn't be an option. In fact, Red GBAs wouldn't be available until 2002, with an exclusive limited edition Red Target GBA in the United States and a Red Zellers GBA in Canada. The GBAs in the games were quietly changed to resemble the Arctic GBA variant which was available on launch. Sonic Adventure 2 saw a release on the GameCube before its predecessor, Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut. This was possibly because the first Sonic Adventure may not have been quite as polished as its sequel. Many players at the time had tried to break Sonic Adventure in order to discover interesting secrets and glitches, and perhaps some hints of differences in earlier builds of the game. While playing as Big the Cat, it's possible to perform an Out of Bounds glitch which can grant him access to the Station Square Hotel prior to clearing the Ice Cap stage. By glitching into the ocean and hitting a teleport spot to enter the hotel, Big will be prevented from accessing the pool area behind a locked door. In this restricted area, it's possible to find two keys which must be placed on pedestals in order to open the pool area, a situation that doesn't occur at any other point. At no stage in the game must the player fit these keys onto the pedestals. It is only by accessing this area before the player is supposed to that this condition is met. 
meaning that the players may have had to open the pool area before accessing it in some earlier builds during the game's development, before it was decided to just have the pool area open at all times instead. Now we're going to spend some time talking about the absolutely insane development of Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. Work on the game started in January 2001 and had to be finished in just 9 months so it could release alongside the GameCube. This was about half the time necessary to make the game normally, which meant 6 to 7 day work weeks of constant crunch would be needed. Though Rogue Leader was co-developed by Factor 5 and LucasArts, the bulk of the game's development was done by Factor 5, a team of 25 people plus 2 freelancers. Unfortunately for the team, most obstacles would come. They couldn't use the CG film models of ships made by ILM for the original trilogy as it wasn't practical to convert them to the polygonal models needed for game development. Instead, usable models were made using Maya. Due to the limited time and resources, some of the models were even made using kids' toys as reference material. An in-house level editing tool called L3D was used for the game's missions, but L3D was an outdated tool made for the original game on N64, and Factor 5 didn't have the time to craft new tools. Roughly half the music for the game is from John Williams's original score, which also saved time. Luckily, Factor 5 had helped develop the Cube's audio system for Nintendo, Musix, and due to their familiarity with the audio tools, they were able to seamlessly blend music dynamically during gameplay, resulting in some of the best audio of the era. This was also partly due to the team adding 5-channel surround sound featuring Dolby Pro Logic 2 tech towards the end of development, making Rogue Leader the first game ever to do so. Another series with a long history of development struggles is Fire Emblem. By the time of Fire Emblem Path of Radiance's release, the series was finally in a position to be well received by English-speaking audiences. The game had a fairly interesting localization into English, with many small alterations being made throughout. In one scene, Ike will recall how he received a harsh scolding from his dad for attempting to reach out and take a medallion from his sister. Some players were curious as to whether the English dialogue was a faithful translation of the original Japanese, and turned to professional translator Cantopia for clarification. Cantopia translated the original paragraph into English, and found that it was almost word for word an accurate interpretation, all except Ike receiving a scolding. In the Japanese game, Ike's dad gave him a, quote, severe beating. This was likely changed due to physical punishment of children being considered a bit more taboo in the West than it is in Japan. It could also be due to ESRB concerns, but this would make some other localization changes in the game seem like very bizarre choices indeed. The localizers actually added multiple profane comments in Marcia's dialogue, and made her generally feistier overall. This includes calling Makalov a brainless eunuch and dung heel. These statements simply don't exist in the Japanese game at all, and were added to the English release. Path of Radiance was a late arrival to the GameCube, but one of the very last games to be published on the system, and certainly the last published by Nintendo, was The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. This game went through a curious development period, having originally been created for the GameCube, only to be simultaneously ported to the Wii in a cross-generational release. Some of the earliest periods of development reveal some curious choices from the dev team, such as one piece of information revealed by Zelda art director Satoru Takizawa surrounding the earliest experiments with the character of Midna. The creation of Link's adventuring partner in this game went through several iterations, with Takazawa stating, The challenge started with brainstorming among designers for ideas, and then we eventually finalized this character through a trial and error process for her shape, facial expressions, actions, etc. In early prototypes, as a placeholder for Midna, Tetra from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker was riding on Wolf Link as he ran around Hyrule. While of course this choice of having Tetra's model be used was purely for prototyping, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to think that Tetra's stature may have contributed to the design of Midna in the final game. Other designs in the game were altered dramatically, even when they were intended to appear all along. The Uku in the final game's release take on the appearance of some sort of creepy bird with a human face, 
but at the time of Twilight Princess HD's release, the official Japanese Zelda Twitter account revealed that originally, the Uku would look more humanoid with bird-like features instead. The final game also has some secrets of its own. Players who've beat the Cave of Ordeals might recall that Room 49 contains three dark nuts for the player to overcome. However, if the player decides to go through the Cave of Ordeals a second time for whatever reason, they'll find that the cave is slightly more difficult, with the 49th room now having an additional fourth dark nut. This is fascinating and all, but this video has had far too little Mario so far. Let's fix that. Of course, one of the biggest releases on the GameCube was Mario's tropical outing, where he soaks up the sun in Super Mario Sunshine. This game has been explored inside and out by gaming fans for years, but even still, there's always more to learn about these big Nintendo titles. One Twitter user, Zelpiku Kirby, discovered an interesting trick that we've frankly never even heard of before that could be performed in Pina Park. If the player enters the level and lures a stew to the edge of the water fountain and flips it over with a spray, they can sling it into the Bowser Jr. balloons and pop them. Normally, these balloons can only be popped using the water rockets during the Mecha Bowser roller coaster event. Unfortunately, if the player pops some balloons and then triggers the roller coaster event, the balloons will have respawned. This is likely because the coaster event uses different balloons in slightly different positions. And while Zelpiku Kirby discovered this trick in the Mario 3D All-Stars version of Sunshine on the Switch, another Twitter user demonstrated that this same trick can indeed be performed in the original GameCube release. The game really focuses on the struggles Mario faces as he explores an island covered in goop, but there were clearly more effects to this goop than would be faced by the plumber during development but which were removed prior to the game's final publication. An unused goop effect can be found in the game's files that, when Mario jumps into it, will cause him to sink like it was quicksand and take damage. This effect causes Mario to perform unique struggling animations and voice clips that are not found anywhere in the final game, suggesting that this goop variant was cut late into development. And that's it for this last episode of DYKG Extra. But you can still catch more DYKG in the usual way, and we will be posting more of the sort of trivia you would see in these episodes over on our second channel, as well as on TikTok. Links to those can be found below. We have really appreciated your support over the years, and we hope that we can continue to entertain and inform you as we progress into the future. Yes, it has been an absolute pleasure making content for you guys, and we can't wait to see more of you in the future. Since this is the last time I get to address you directly, Ocarina, herbs, aluminium, fuck you, woo, woo. Just kidding, we're cool. Thank you for watching.